Well, I've got a bit of a mini talk series. It's over um, two weeks. If you were here last week, I decided to start the term by preaching on Ecclesiastes, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It's not often a preacher can say everything is vanity, um, but I enjoyed saying that many times. Now, if you're wondering why I said that, then you're going to have to catch up. You can do so on our YouTube channel, for which you should subscribe and hit that bell notification to get important updates. Seamless. Seamless. So what are we going to talk about today and next week? Well, we're going to talk about a subject which, in some respects, is the hardest thing to talk about in church. And it isn't sex. And it isn't politics. Someone said, oh, that's good. It's money. <laughs> a lot of hecklers on the front row here. I like it. Go, Tony. Now, maybe you're here this morning. And you've been to churches before which seem to talk about money all the time, every week. They're giving you the feeling that all they're interested in is your money. Or maybe you've watched one of those ministries online who have talked about money every time and said, if you sow 10 pounds or $10, next week you will receive $1,000. You know the ones. As your pastor, do not give to those ministries. And if you're wondering why I said that, you can always speak to me afterwards. And so given that background, maybe when I said money, you were like, oh boy, why did I come this week? And if you're new, welcome. <laughs> For the record, it was last year that I preached on money, so there you go. And, um, but maybe you've been to churches which never talked about money because... The view was that it was, you know, it wasn't proper to discuss something so base and so earthly. Well, this morning, church, I want to, by the grace of God, please help me, Lord, present what I believe to be a balanced biblical viewpoint on money and its role in our lives and our relationship with the Lord. Now, let me start by asking a question. How do you feel about money? Does it make you feel good? Or does it evoke feelings and emotions which are altogether negative? Maybe you think about money, about how much you have, uh, how much you need, how much you'd like to have, what you spend it on, what you shouldn't spend it on. And we all think those things. I'm not saying those thoughts are wrong, but let me ask you another question. Are there any spiritual thoughts amongst those questions. For example, how much should I give? Should I give more? Is my heart position that of generosity towards God? Am I in bondage to money so that I am fearful of poverty, that I am in bondage to it so that I cannot give? Now, if you're anything like me, then probably you think about those questions a lot less than the first set of questions. And so what I want to concentrate on this morning, church, is the questions that God is presenting to us in his word. Uh, as one old preacher said, this isn't the preacher preaching and teaching and speaking, this is God's word saying it. And I'm gonna be basing this, you'll be pleased to know, on a lot of Bible. And this is not me saying what I think about money. This is what God says about money. Now, at this stage, uh, maybe you're wondering why one would turn to the Bible for financial advice. Mark, there is a plethora of books out there and YouTube channels that will regale you with information about how you can generate wealth and, and, uh, and, and money and financial advice. Because after all, Mark, doesn't the Bible just deal with much higher matters? You know, things like life and death. Well, what if I told you that half of the parables deal with money? What if I told you there is more about money in the Bible than about heaven and hell? There is more about money in the Bible than prayer. This is when you have online a fact check box. The pastor is factually correct at this point. There are hundreds of verses in the Bible that deal about our finances. And why? Because simply where our treasure is, there our heart is also. 
Because when you speak about money, money has power. Money itself is not evil, but indeed the root of it and the desire of it, as we shall see, is. So how are we going to look at it this morning? Let me give you a a sense of direction. I'm going to, by the grace of God, look at a foundation, a worldview on money from the Bible and how it plays in our lives. Secondly, I then want to look at the resulting encouragement and warnings that God gives us about money. Thirdly, having established that, we're going to look specifically at money advice around tithings and offerings. And then lastly, the promises that are attached to giving. It's a bit like a pyramid. First of all, I want to establish the foundation because um, most of the time we have a wrong foundation about money. And so all the rest of the stuff just goes over our head. So let's look at that. Let's start at the foundation. We have to look first at two viewpoints about money. There's the world's view and what God says about money. So let's look at the world's view. It is, to summarize this, accumulation, receive. It is focused on self-interest, personal needs over the needs of others. Listen, we see it in the marketing messages every day, over and over again, don't we? In fact, research on the number of ads suggests that we are exposed to anywhere between 4,000 and 10,000 ads daily. Compare that with the 70s when it was between 500 and 1,600 ads a day. Massive. And what are the promises of these ads? Buy this and be a better person. Buy this and have more fun. Buy this and enjoy your life. Buy this and have more convenient life. Right? These are the promises of these ads. And what does this all revolve around? Well, my best, my three best friends, me, myself, and I. That is the world's view of money. It is looking to accumulate for you and for your benefit. Listen, we looked at the book of Ecclesiastes last week, as I've referenced already, and the message uh, that the teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes gives around money and pleasure is that it's all vanity. Hevel is the Hebrew word. It means it's all vapor. It's all smoke. You can't grab onto it. You can't hold onto it. It doesn't have eternal value. And yet what the world will tell you is that is the most valuable thing. It is accumulating money and wealth. So what is God's viewpoint on it then? Conversely, well, it can be summed up in one simple verse. There is one verse that says it all, and there are other verses that back this up, and it's found in Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If God had a mic, that would be a drop the mic moment, wouldn't it? It's all mine. Boom. Boom. That has to be our starting point, the foundation when we think about money. If we don't acknowledge and understand that it is God's money, then we're not going to be able to walk in the other things that we're going to look at. You see, the money you have and the possessions you have are not owned by you. Now, I know your bank account has your name on it. Your share certificates, if you have any, would have your name on it. But... We need to recognize, brothers and sisters, that everything we have, every good gift comes from heaven above and that God owns it all. And so if God is the owner, it means we are the managers. Or to put it another way, the Bible uses the word steward. You see, an owner has rights, a manager has responsibilities. Let that sink in. An owner has rights. God has rights over the money that we have. We as managers have responsibilities to God, our owner. Now, that is not what you will hear the world tell you. You know, let's, let's just unpack this a bit so we fully understand the concept. A trustee of an estate is a good example, I think. The estate is not theirs. They don't own the estate, but They are there to manage the estate on behalf of the owner. And you could read parable after parable that talks about that concept. Now, 
God, therefore, has the right to do whatever he wants and has the right to direct us on how we use his money. And so, therefore, contrasting the theme of accumulate, accumulate for me, for me, myself, and I, the Bible's theme is not one of accumulation. It is one of distribution under his ownership. Or put it another way, we see in the world a model for those who want to get all they can and in the Bible, a model for all those who want to give all they can. Like if I were to sum that up, and boy, can I just tell you, by the way, I'm preaching to myself first, all right? You're more than welcome to join in and listen. Like if there were a thorn in my side, this is my thorn in my side. I've shared before, I have a very challenging and complex relationship with money. This is my thorn. And so it wasn't easy putting this talk together because you better know that the preacher needs to live the word first before he can preach the word. We think the money is ours, but newsflash, it isn't. And so when, we go, when I go back to the initial question of what do you think about money, and I said, you think about what can I get? Do I need more money? All those kind of things. And then I said, what about the spiritual question? In reality, the spiritual questions should be the first questions. Hey, owner, what would you like me to do with your money today? Like, how do you want me to be a steward of that which you own, that which you have rights to? And this is so countercultural that when I say it, I even can feel how I feel. I'm like, man, this just sounds so alien. We have been so ingrained in the world system to think that the money is ours. Now, that is not to say that God doesn't want to enjoy the fruits of our labor and use money to bless us, and we're going to look at that in a moment. He is a good owner. He is a good God. But we have to start. If, you, if, you, if you're here and you're thinking, well, I just don't agree with you, Mark. Well, can I suggest that you go away and read the Bible? Because these aren't my words. These are God's words. And if you don't, if you can't, if we can't agree on that premise, then what I'm going to give you next is going to be a challenge to you. And so let's look, as we build that foundation, at the encouragement and the warning the Bible has about money, because it gives us both. So let's look at Luke 6, 38. This is the encouragement that gives, that God gives us. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. I don't know about you, but there's some verses in the Bible I wish weren't there. This is one of them. I mean, like, really? You mean I've got my part to play in the blessings that you give me? Now, at this point, I know I can, I can almost hear what you might be saying. Whoa, steady, Mark. Don't be one of those prosperity preachers. Now, listen, I'll tell you what happens with heresy. You take a truth and you magnify it. So there is blessings attached to how we give. Like that, that is a biblical reality. Now what happens is people will take that and say, well, that, what that means is you sow 10 and you get 1,000 next Monday at 12 p.m. Like the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says if you give, God will, give, will bless you. So let's not ignore this because of some bad teaching that we've heard, Okay. You hear my heart. This is what God talking. He's saying, listen, how you handle your money determines how I bless you. Ooh. Why? Because it's not yours. I'm the owner and I'm entrusting you to be a good steward and to operate under my direction. And I want to say this, the heart of this is this, you cannot outgive God. That's the heart of this. It's not like, give it all away so I can see you as poor. No, no, no. God is saying, listen, what is the language? Pressed down, shaken together, running over. I mean, this is a God of abundance. This is a God that wants to bless you. And he's saying, listen, if you can be faithful in the small that I've given you, I'm going to give you more. I'm not going to give you an equation for what that looks like because the Bible doesn't say what it looks like. I don't know what that looks like. I'm just preaching what the Word of God says. And so the question for us is not calculating what that looks like. It's a question of do we trust what God's Word says? 
But there is a warning attached. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10. This is the Apostle Paul writing uh, to Timothy. He says, but those who want to get rich, those who want to accumulate wealth, fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish desires which plunge men and women into destruction. You know, desire for money causes people to be dishonest. In some cases, to steal, and in some cases, to kill. Money is such a dangerous thing if it isn't under the control of God. Like, have you heard that phrase, your purchase power? Funny that, isn't it? Power. Money has a power. Money is not evil. Money is a tool, but the root of it is. And so it's saying here, listen, I want to give you an encouragement and a warning. If you recognize that I'm the owner, and if you look to give and to be generous and to give as I direct you, then I'm going to give you blessings. But let me tell you something. If you look to be a reservoir and not a river and look to accumulate, that, that water is going to get stinky. I mean, like the, the Bible has a lot to say about money. So as we continue, are you following me? Good. We've looked at the founding principle, which is that it's not ours, and that we have an owner and we are stewards. We've looked, therefore, at the resulting encouragement that God gives us. He's saying, out of my heart of desire to bless you, go give, because that's a kingdom principle. That's how I've designed things. The error that you sow, you will reap. Like, we see that in many areas of our lives. And he's saying, but here's a warning right now. Listen, money is dangerous. If you operate outside of the directions of the owner, then you are in dangerous territory. I would say usually the case is that wealth, lots of wealth is a curse, not a blessing. I use the word usually. So let's look at point three then, having established on our pyramid Let's look at some more specific advice, God's plan for our money then. And we're going to turn together to read Malachi 3, verse 8. Now, this is in the Old Testament. It's the last book of the Old Testament. And we're going to read some specific instructions that the Lord gives us about how we deal with our money as stewards. 3, 8, 12 says this. <clears throat> Will man rob God? That's an interesting, great way to start. That will get our attention. Will man rob God? Well, you are robbing me. But you say, well, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, have, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and your contributions, your offerings. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test. This is the only place in the Bible that God says, put me to the test. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I want to unpack this together. Before I do, I want to just go head on to two objections that you may have in your head right now. Number one, isn't that for Israel, Mark? I mean, hey, we're New Testament believers. Can I just say, God hasn't revoked this in the New Testament. In fact, when you look at giving, Jesus ups the ante. He ups the ante. Like, your tithe is not completion, it's the starting point. And so God is speaking to Israel, but the principle applies to us all. Are you hearing me? The second objection is this. Mark, isn't tithing an Old Testament law? I've heard that one. Well, can I just say, technically, the tithe happened before the law was established. Abraham, Abraham had, uh, there was a, a war, they were successful, and um, Melchizedek, the priest, came, and he gave a, a tithe in thankfulness to God for the victory. 
That was established before the law. So we're in New Testament, New Covenant believers. That doesn't mean that's removed. Now, isn't it interesting? It says in Hebrews that Jesus is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What victory did he win for us? The victory over sin and death. And what is our response? Our tithe. So before you look at this and dismiss this, can I suggest that this is speaking to you and me? So it says, what does it say? Bring into the storehouse. I mean, there's so much it says here. Test me if, uh, if I will not open the windows of heaven. There are promises of God attached to tithing, which I'll look at. Now, what is a tithe? Tithe actually means 10%. You can't tithe 6%. You can't tithe 5. You can't tithe 8. You tithe 10. And it says, bring into the storehouse. This, this is the storehouse. I don't know if I'm going to be, un- I don't care if I'm unpopular. Um, you can't split your tithe up to different places in my opinion. And I say in my opinion, because you, you can speak to God about that. I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord. Okay, hear my heart. Our tithe goes into the storehouse, our offerings go elsewhere. And indeed, it can still go into the storehouse. And within this scripture, I think it gives us some reasons why we give to God. Number one, provide for the work of the Lord. Like bring it into the storehouse so everyone is fed. Like this is your storehouse. If you are a a, a member of this church, if you call this church your home, whether you're in Hatfield, in Hemel, or in St. Albans, this is your storehouse. You should be, our expectation is that if you're part of this church, you are tithing. That's our expectation. You can read it in in our booklets, I've said it on many of our welcome lunches. Number one, it says to provide for the needs of others. So we provide for the work of the Lord, get the gospel out, and provide for the needs of others. Number three, it says to prove his faithfulness. God is saying, listen, guys, I want to show you how much I love you. Test me, come on, do it. I can't wait to show you how faithful I am to you. I can't wait to pour out my blessings upon you. Please, will you do it? Like, tithe. And four, I want to add this in. It's not in this scripture, but it's elsewhere in the Bible. In worship and surrender to him. Romans 12, 1, offer your whole selves, your whole life as a living sacrifice. That is your worship to God. Like, you know, it's often been said, the wallet is the last thing to be converted. So how are we to give, brothers and sisters? Cheerfully. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly, you see, this is, this is the New Testament. So you know, for those of you who, who want to discard the Old Testament, this is the New Testament. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So listen, how do you marry this up with the instruction of the Lord? Well, I say, Lord, I I, I recognize, Lord, that tithing is an act of obedience. Uh, Lord, but help me. Now, I want to say this. There is grace. If you're in this room and you haven't tithed and you've been struggling, I don't want you leaving this place feeling condemned. I want you to feel this place feeling encouraged that you want to start and try tithing. Okay, hear my heart. That's my heart for you. And there is grace in it. And God says, I want you to be cheerful in that. And so often I pray, Lord, just help me to be cheerful about this. Like move my heart. Lord, help my heart align with your heart. And God God does that. God does that. Each one must do. He says his grace will abound to you. So we've established the foundational viewpoint or worldview that it's not our money. So our thinking therefore needs to be different. We've established on the basis of that the general warnings and encouragement that God gives us about money. We then look at the place of tithing and how that's part of God's uh, way in which we are to steward his money. And next week we'll look at offerings, which is over and above your tithe. But I want to look now and focus on the rest of this talk 
on what the promises are attached to giving, what the promises are. The first one we see in Malachi, in verse 11, it says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And so his promises are his protection. Now, we clearly are in not in, you know, in an agricultural setting. Um, you, maybe you have fruits and soil, but most of us don't. We have possessions that look different. And so what does this mean about us today? It means that when we go to God and we seek him for how we steward his money, God will protect us from decisions we make. I mean, I recalled recently, many, many years ago, I um, was going to buy a new car. And I went to the showroom and I specced it out and it was nice and shiny and all that stuff. And I put a deposit down. And they said, well, it's going to be about three, four months until it's delivered. And then you pay the balance. And it was a hefty balance. And I'll be completely honest with you. Can I, can I be honest with you? Is this safe? I'm looking at the people online because I just realized I'm broadcasting. <laughs> Hello, world. Um, there was a niggle. Like, I, if I'm honest, I didn't say, Lord God, is this the best use of the money you've given me to do this? Like, my car I had at the time was sufficient, to be honest. Anyway, so I went ahead, and there was a bit of a niggle, but I did it. Three months passed, and I said, we're sorry, sir, there's been a delay on the delivery of the cars, and it's got a problem, because it was a new car, a new model as well. I said, okay, that's fine. So another month passed. Sorry, sir, it's been delayed. I'm like, oh, hmm, this is interesting. I'm a, I'm a slow learner. I'm like, maybe, Lord, you're giving me an out here. Another month passed. Sorry, sir, really. So this went into the new year now. Um, God is so gracious. Sorry, sir, but listen, we recognize the challenge. You know, we, we can give you a deposit back if you want. I was like, okay, let me have a think about it. Still slow, because I really wanted the car. I mean, it had 22-inch wheels. Huh? Um, Lord Jesus, are you trying to protect me from a really bad decision? Yes, I am, Mark. Excuse me. Can I have my deposit back, please? Thank you the phone down. I look back at that time, and if I would have gone with that, that would have caused us some problems with that decision. And maybe as I speak, you're reflecting on some of your own financial decisions. You go, wow, yeah, I, you know what? God saved me from that. Or conversely, I should have listened to God. I got into a whole ton of debt because of that. Number two, his generosity towards us. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. You know, I, have, uh, I was speaking to someone recently about money, and, um, and they relayed a story to me about giving that I wanted to share the testimony because it really speaks to this. Um, they, they had a job, and in addition to the job, they had a contract with another uh, organization for a year. And... <clears throat> And, she, and that person was tithing out of both their salary and the, uh, and the, and the money they received from, from that contract. Now, the contract came to an end, and they thought to themselves, well, I really feel led to give a thanks offering to God over and above the tithe I'd given through that contract. But then they thought, but wait a minute. I mean, I might not get the contract renewed. And, and, they, and this, was a, this was a Saturday. Um, and they said, I made a decision on the Saturday that I was going to give a thanks offering. They go into work on Monday, and their boss calls them in the office and says, listen, we want to give you a pay rise. And they received a pay rise in that moment, literally two days after they'd made the decision to give a thanks offering. I mean, what a testimony. And I suspect there are other people, I have spoken to other people that tie and say, you know what? God, God has met all my needs in amazing ways as I have tithed. And some of you haven't seen those amazing ways because you haven't tithed. Some of you have yet to see the provision of God in miraculous ways because you have been holding on to your money and not giving it to God. Number three, his sufficiency for us. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. You know, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Listen, I, I think this is very interesting and this is where I battle with. So that having all sufficiency in all things that 
you may abound in every good work. It doesn't say that you may have all things in sufficiency for the luxuries in life that you really require so that rather than have just one stream in service, you can pay for four. Rather than have one cup of coffee a week, you can have four. And rather than Prosecco, you can have champagne. I do like champagne. Birth Clico, that's my favorite. <laughs> Stick to the notes, Mark. <clears throat> and I think what happens is, in, in our world, in our Western society, we have redefined the de definition of need to wants and luxuries. And our fear is not that God will provide our needs. I think we know he will, but he won't provide our luxuries. Please, don't I not have to give up my fourth streaming service? Please, I don't want to have to drink Prosecco one more time. Like, seriously, think about it. I know we're laughing, but it's true, right? And it says that he will give you so all grace may abound so in your good works. Like the, the output here is that I would be a good servant of Christ and do his work and extend his kingdom. There are promises attached to tithing. I want to, I want to bring the plane into a land here. Because how do we respond? Like, it's so difficult, money. I haven't looked forward to preaching this. Not because I'm, like, uncomfortable about preaching about money, but I recognize myself and for you as your pastor the difficulties we have with money. Like, my heart really for you guys is that you would be free in your finances and walk in the blessings that God has for you. That, that is my, my heart for you. And please hear, I don't want you to walk out feeling condemned and battered and bruised. I want you to feel excited and encouraged. And, but what I want to say as clearly as I can, that deep down at the fundamental root of this, giving to God is a matter of trust and obedience. Well, Mark, you don't know my circumstances. I don't need to know your circumstances. God knows them. In fact, he knew them when he wrote this book. The question is, can you trust God with 10% of what you have? Okay, I'm going to confess again. This is very... Uh, helpful for me. Free counseling. Did I check with Steph first? No. Thank you, darling. Um, I have, since I worked long, long time ago, always, I would say most of the time tithe. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Uh, there have been short and very infrequent seasons where I have felt the financial pressure of things and I've stopped tithing for a very brief moment of time. Why? Because I thought I could use those finances to just help me. Can I tell you what I discovered? It didn't help me. Like, hear it from a preacher that's lived it. Hear it from someone that shares the same ups and downs with money and struggles as you. Saving those first fruits for yourself doesn't mean you have more. I know it on a calculator, it may seem that you do, but it doesn't. Take it from me. Take it from me. Give to Caesar's what is Caesar's, give to God's what is God's. What does that mean? Well, you've got your pot of money, give to God's what's God's, and then give to Caesar's. It doesn't say, give to the tax man first, and then give to God the bit afterwards, if you've got a question of whether it's pre or post-tax. Just saying. He's saying, listen, live your life around your tithe, not the other way around. Like for some of you here, I think this may mean restructuring your finances and rethinking about your financial commitments because your first commitment should be to God, like out of obedience and trust. Like if, if you don't do that, then the question you've got to answer yourself is, do I trust God's word and do I trust him to, to support what I need and to provide? Like that, that is the fundamental question that you have to ask and that I have to ask and that I battle with all the time. That is my thorn in my side. Now, I realize it's not that easy. There is a spiritual dynamic to money, that there is a power about it. So how do you break the power of money? You give. How do you break a spirit of poverty? You give. Um, there's a great quote from a French sociologist um, called Jacques Ellul. Ian and Lucy, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Was that a Trebian? Well done, Mark. Oh, oh, so-so, well, fair enough. Thank you, Ian. And this is what Jacques said, and it's got some uh, French flair in this with the language. There is one act par excellence which profanes money by going directly against 
the law of money, an act for which money is not made, this act is given. I'm going to read it again. Oh, there is one act par excellence. <laughs> which profans money. Sorry to everyone who's French or speaks French, I apologize. By going directly against the law of money, the power of money, an act of which money is not made, that is the act of giving. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, let's make a start. Let's make a start. I want you to walk in the blessings of God. If you believe this is God's word, if you believe the words that I've said, then why don't we just test God? Because he told us to. Because there's freedom. Listen, I've got to tell you something right now. And you know my story. We've had a lot of money and nothing. And I have laid in bed many a time with lots of money and felt fearful about provision and stressed and worried about loss. And I have laid in bed with nothing and felt a similar thing. Like money won't take away that. I know millionaires that panic. Millionaires that never feel they have enough. Money won't give you security, God gives us security. Church, let's stand.